we often think about big data as this proper noun, capital B, big, and capital D, data, when in fact it's really just an adjective, big, describing something, data, that's been around since the dawn of time. You've heard from experts all morning. You've heard about robotics and 3D printing, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And to put it in context, I think we can think of these as inputs and, and think of them as outputs. So, excuse me, robotics, 3D printing, these are creators of data. These are things that are creating data that's making the data, quote, big. On the other hand, you have machine learning and artificial intelligence. These are the logical extensions of having all the data. Now that we have the data, how can we get one step closer to intelligence? Just quickly, think of this first wave of data as the rise of Oracle, relational databases, structured data. Second wave, roughly advent of Hadoop, distributed systems, the ability to store unstructured data. Today, we're constantly bombarded with the idea of data. Everyone has statistics on what happens in an internet minute, etc. Now, the one thing I will highlight in manufacturing, this is generally true for all industries, but for manufacturing in specifically, the data historian has been collecting large-scale time series data for many decades much longer that Pinterest and Twitter have been collecting favorites and collecting likes. So that was all a step back, looking at the past. Looking into the future, everything is up and to the right. Take sensors, for example. In addition to all of the devices, things that have already been connected to the internet, Gartner expects that every single day, 5.5 million additional devices and, quote, things will be connected to the internet. Likewise, Platforms. We had the rise of PCs, followed by the internet, followed by social networks, and most recently, smartphones. In the same amount of time, the adoption of smartphones was 10 times that of PCs. Lastly, we all know what happens in an internet minute. Number of tweets, number of YouTube videos downloaded, number of emails sent. What's more interesting in this context, and especially as an enterprise investor, is What's the amount of data that's streaming off an airplane, off other industrial systems, off wind turbines, etc.? So, in the old world, we would all agree that Fiat, Chrysler, Honda, these are all asset-intensive businesses. Fast forward, Uber. Uber owns zero vehicles, and they command a supposed private value of 50 billion. I heard Peter mention 67 billion, so maybe my data is a little out of date. Uh, Fiat and Honda are real asset intensive. Uber is data as an asset intensive. And I'm trying to impart to you that data can no longer be ignored. Uber is the classic canonical textbook case of network effects. As the number of drivers rise, the number of participants rise on the platform, a number of things happen. Drivers don't wait as long between rides. Passengers don't wait as long to hail a cab or the, today's equivalent of a cab. Pr prices are optimized, bad actors are weeded out. And as a result, you reach this natural equilibrium between supply and demand. And this is going to be true across markets for, for Uber. Secondly, Uber, canonical case of moving to a service model. Instead of selling you the car, Uber sells you a ride in said car. And as a result, they're able to really effectively match the value generated with the value received on the other end. Now, Uber is not doing this for the good and for the love of passengers and drivers. As a result, Uber is collecting this superset of data. Every single ride, Uber collects a little bit more data by the second, and as a result, they're able to finely tune their models. They're better able to improve all the things I just mentioned, better improve prices, better optimize for supply and demand. Uber ends up with a computational, computational advantage. It is my belief that the winner in this space will be the one with the most data. The reason being that yield man that ride sharing is a very complex yield management equation, and it's one that's dynamic and always changing. There's nothing static about it. Another great example, Nokia. We all think of it as a hardware company. Classic competitive strategic advantages. They had scope, they had great supply chain R&D, and beat R&D budgets, etc. Enter Apple. Late 2000s, Apple had less than 10% market share. <coughs> Excuse me. Apple had less than 10% market share, and they had something that hadn't yet been recognized, and that was a platform. As you can see here, the value of Apple is not the hardware alone. That value of Apple is the combination of the hardware, which we all know in this room is very hard. You take raw materials, supply chain, it's very complex. 
in addition, the differentiated software. The Apple App Store brings together producers and consumers in a very high value exchange, of which Apple takes a cut of each and every one of those transactions. Unlike many hardware products where you buy it once, you never interact with the, the um, producer again, with Apple, it's very likely that all of us in this room continue to interact with Apple. We may buy music, we may, may rent movies, subscribe to Apple Music. These are all marginal cost, near zero, and Apple is able to drive a lot of this premium. The iPhone, in total, to date, has generated more than $600 billion in revenue, arguably one of the, the most successful products ever.